So my point is that in scripture, there's really strong warnings about teachings that are uh, aberrant and they may not rise to the level of outright heresy, um, but it doesn't mean that they're not really dangerous. Now, this is something that comes up a lot and it's probably one of the most core questions I'll ask you in this whole interview, because people might be listening to this and wrestling with a few things. And one of the things that people I'm sure are thinking about is, okay, well, what's the deal breaker here, right? So there's some, some bad theology. There's some questionable things that they might consider to be secondary. So I would say there's bad theology and there's bad teachers. Then there's false the theology and false teachers. And some people don't think it's a big deal. What's going on at Bethel here? So for those watching, how would you stress why this is uh, all dangerous? And what are your thoughts about those that say that Bethel teaches an outright false gospel and they're all false teachers? I'll start. And I think Doug may have some things he wants to say here, but I think people make a mistake and they assume that there's only like two levels of error. There's heresy. That would be like denying an essential Christian doctrine. Like, like if you deny that Jesus is God or you deny the Trinity, that makes you a heretic. You're outside the Christian faith, right? So people think there's that level of error. And then they think there's kind of just these secondary, non-important errors, uh, you know, maybe about the style of worship music you listen to or something about eschatology or something like that. But they forget that there's this category of error of, of doctrines that are aberrant. That means that they are serious doctrinal error. And, and they're dangerous. They pose dangers to those who embrace them. People who embrace aberrant theology are in danger of shipwrecking their faith. Um, and and the, the teachings lead to uh, uh, spiritual abuse. They lead to confusion mm. about the nature of the gospel. Mm. Um, in the case of New Age practices, they, they could be opening doors up to demonic influence. You know, these, so there's some really serious um, uh, danger here with the teachings. Um the, uh, and uh, one thing people forget too is in scripture, when you see the apostles uh, warn against false teaching, they don't warn just about doctrines that are outright heretical, like denying the deity of Christ. They do warn about those things, but um, they also warn about teachings that would fall into the cat, what we would describe as aberrant theology. So for example, in Jude, false teachers are spoken of as relying on their dreams, among other things. And in 2 Corinthians 11, we could see uh, when Paul's critiquing these, these so-called, you know, the super apostles, these, these false teachers, um, they were claiming that the work they did was on the same terms as what the apostles of Christ did, what Paul did. So my point is that in scripture, there's really strong warnings about teachings that are uh, aberrant and they may not rise to the level of outright heresy, um, but it doesn't mean that they're not really dangerous and, and that we shouldn't warn and caution against those teachings. And so I think people, people forget that. Hmm. Well, and they have practical implications as well. So it's not just what do you believe and is it true, but it's how are you functioning? How do you conceive of the Christian life and of growth and maturity and uh, prayer and corporate worship, all of these these things are infected with this error. And uh, just to illustrate, you know, uh, in theology, theologians distinguish between systematic theology, sometimes they call it dogmatic theology, and uh, these are basic truths in major categories of belief about God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Church, and so forth. And uh, our source of knowledge uh, for this is the the Scriptures. But there's another branch of theology called practical theology, which concerns the things that we do together and individually. Uh, prayer is an example. So what is your theology of prayer? That's a question of practical theology. Uh, what kind of activity is prayer and how do you do it effectively and properly? Um, that too should be informed by Scripture. So now we come to um, their teaching about petitionary prayer and how they teach, uh, in effect, that it's inferior to 
an, another form of praying, which is vastly greater and much more reflective of deep faith, and that is uh, decrees or uh, declaration prayers. Well, if declaration prayers are not taught in Scripture, and that's not a practice that is commended by Scripture and explained in Scripture, then where is it coming from? And more important, are you really living a prayerful life if that's the way you pray? I would say that if that's not prayer, but it's something else, then you may think that you're a very prayerful person when, in fact, uh, you're not you're, you're not prayerful at all. You just believe that you are because of what you've been taught. And, of course, in this movement, actually in the church in general, most of our practical, practical theology is learned. Uh, through observation and imitation. We see it done uh, by people around us, and we begin to do the same thing. You know, we learn to pray that way. Sometimes children growing up in Christian homes and going to church all their lives learn how to pray chiefly that way rather than through a study of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Or uh, adults who come to faith, they are around Christians, and they think, oh, well, this is how you pray. And you imitate their models. Well, that's what's going on in this movement is that people are imitating these models and they learn language, lingo, ways of talking about God, and they acquire expectations about what intimacy with God looks like and what it means to be a vibrant Christian and to be part of a lively spirit-led church. Mm -hmm. And most of this is just insinuated or caught in the atmosphere by being around people who do it a certain way. And so then they they may not have biblical criteria or biblical principles and standards for truly evaluating a work of God and knowing whether a church is tracking with the Spirit or not. It's not all about signs and wonders, which can be performed even by false prophets, according to Jesus and uh, other New Testament, New Testament writers uh, who've warned us about this possibility. So yes, it's a very real uh, risk to our thinking and our practice if we aren't careful to examine these things in the light of Scripture. 